This is a shit poker graph. But it's the most common shape of poker graph that I see. The red line is dragging the green line down like a ball and chain. The green line is of course the total winnings or losses. And the red line is the non-showdown line, representing all the times that the student lost the pot by folding. This blue line is doing okay, but that's only because the student is putting money into the pot way too selectively and not doing the two key things that I'm going to outline today. I'm going to discuss some example hands now and show you guys how to fix the most common and repulsive shape of poker graph in this game that we know and love. Let's go. The first of the two things that we're going to outline today is the ability to apply pressure in spots where fold equity is at a premium. This is a situation where your range is doing pretty well in the big blind. This board is quite a bit better for you than it is for the button and it definitely more than equalizes the disadvantage you incur by being the preflop caller. Thus, we start with a small lead here, which is definitely okay, and I think it's a play in practice that people will struggle with. This turn is another card that just adds fuel to the fire of our range advantage, the seven of clubs connecting with a ton of the stuff that we semi-bluffed on the flop, and many of our value bets there are still really strong on this card. Billin's range is going to have some hands at will call again. There's going to be over pairs in there for sure. There's going to be things like ace-5, ace-4, ace-3, 6-X, stuff like king-6, queen-6, jack-6. These are all present, it being late position. We arrive on this queen of clubs river. All of our flushes now get there as well. Yes, our opponent can have a club draw, but did you notice the turn timing? No, you didn't. Wake up, guys. The turn timing was really, really slow. I don't think anybody takes that long to call a turn with a flush draw. So this is a flush-starved range. It's a range that doesn't have many sets or straights or two pair. It's a one pair infested range. And slight overbets are a really cool way to leverage fold equity. You're betting a little bit more than the pot. You're making it look really big. The idea here is that people won't really react differently between this and a bet like 28. So why make it 28? Why thoughtlessly press the 1.5x pot button like a robot when you can find a sweet spot a bet sizing that capitalizes on the elasticity or lack thereof in this situation, meaning that villain just won't be sensitive enough to your exact sizing. This is a really good deal. Villain does eventually fold, and we pick up a really nice pot. This is the kind of pot that red line sufferers, people with a ball and chain of a red line dragging down their results, just aren't capitalizing on often enough. Note the sizing, note the timing tell, Note the reading of the board in the opponent's range and the execution of this really cool bluff. Okay, another hand where we take advantage of a range that's just folding far too often, more often than it should be. Note the high VPIP here of 49. This is about as close to a HUD as we get on GG Poker. This is going to be a recreational player with a really wide range. They're going to be unskilled. They're going to lack polarization, meaning that they're leading to randomly and merged in a lot of spots. I think going for the turn bet here is all right, but we decide to check this time with 8-7. This is fine too. And then Villain goes for this block bet. Now this isn't the kind of small value heavy range that you're going to see from a regular here. This sizing could mean absolutely anything. So there could be a ton of bluffs in this sizing from a weaker player. And weaker players really over bluff this kind of sizing by just failing to have that 4 to 1 value to bluff ratio that they need to have to be quote unquote balanced here. So even though they've filtered a little bit on the flop, they started off with a really wide base range. They're probably leading way too many combos of their 4x and ace high and 7s and 6s and things like that. We're risking 9 here to win 12. Well, 10 to win 12. It needs to work about 45% of the time. Villain quickly folds another really cool spot to scoop a pot that many people just don't find. This is how you're going to fix that plummeting red line. The last few spots we've looked at have been examples of exploitative aggression, but this spot is a theoretically required bluff. Another reason that people have this really suffering red line is that they fail to find spots for bluffing that are actually mandatory in game theory. The Carrot Poker School teaches you all about that, especially in grade 2. You can check that out at carrotcorner.com. But back to this hand with the Queen 10 here, we have an optional raise on the flop here in theory. I'd recommend not taking this raise spot against a weaker player for a few reasons. Firstly, they're going to 3-bet the flop more than they should with things like ace-king, ace-8, pocket-8s, etc. Denying your equity and forcing you to fold. Secondly, the big bet is usually just a bit stronger than a small one and you often get people that just don't find the low equity bluffs in their range. So we opt not to take the flop spot. But on the turn, this is a situation where we really don't have much choice. Note that we don't have any showdown value here. Calling and leading the river isn't really part of our toolkit in most situations. So the cleanest way to attack now is just to bluff raise with the nut flush draw and gut shot. It's true that sometimes we still get jammed on here on the turn, 
but this is a spot where the EV of raising in-game theory is just higher than all other plays. If you don't believe me, look it up in your solvers. This is a mandatory bluff raise. The clues here are that you are out of position, so calling is just dropping an EV. You have too much equity to fold. You have implied odds. You have a nut draw with another draw. When you have all of that going on, but calling is so terrible, you're just going to have to raise. It's going to be the one and only true way of being able to put money in the pot here. And of course, you can't fold with a draw this powerful. On to the next hand. Pay attention to spots where people cap their range and then under protect it later. Button versus Big Blind here, I'd recommend C betting this board against most people. There is a bit of a tendency in a pool like this in quite a soft game for people to just lead the turn randomly when you check back the flop. You don't really want that happening with the 4 3 of diamonds. So we go for a, a bet check line here and we arrive on this river. And this is the check, this key moment here where villain checks the river. This is where villain's going to be super underprotected. They're meant to trap with some flushes, especially with blockers to our calling range. They're meant to do a ton of weird stuff here in GTO. The out of position game is just generally very tricky trappy. And we cover that a lot in grade two lecture five of the Carrot Poker School. But what you need to understand in this spot is that your opponent is going to be overloaded with 7x, 9x, pocket eights, king x, weak hands like this, 10x, and they're not going to be turning enough hands into bluffs that are towards the bottom of their range either. Practically everything you can think of, everything under the sun has got there on this river. But most people don't comprehend that and they don't piece it together fast enough to realize that 7x and 9x and pocket 6s and pocket 5s and stuff like this are now becoming mandatory theoretical bluffs. So these hands are overrepresented in their range. The nutty trappy hands are underrepresented. This is a spot where betting is fine in theory. Notice that I pick another sort of elasticity sweet spot here. If you have a look at this river sizing one more time, you'll see that I'm picking a size that looks like a reasonably sized bet. You can see from villain's timing here, look how quickly they fold. This is in real time. They're not noticing the difference between 5.5 and 6.9 when they get here with a hand like eights. They're just saying, well, I don't like my hand. I'm not paying this off and they're folding. Great bluff spot. If you miss this one and show your hand down because you're saying something like, well, it doesn't make sense. I would have bet most of my good hands on the turn. You could always invent negative reasons to give up and to not put money in the pot. And that's what's going to destroy you as a poker player. That's what's going to give you that cursed red line. We've talked about bluffing, guys. Now let's talk about value betting properly. Then value betting is a key skill. You have to fight all of those temptations, all of those monsters under the bed that make you want to check back. We open this hand in the hijack against the big blind and a weaker player calls. We know that from the stack depth, the BPIP on the HUD here, just basically everything is making that 100% clear. We go for a turn bet here that just leverages like the SBR1 on the river that just sets up like a smooth geometric-ish sizing. Might have been better to leave slightly less than pot psychologically, but no big deal. And I think this is a river spot where honestly, when you break down the opponent's range, although your gut reaction to this card is to recoil and say, oh no, it's an ace, this is not good for me. They can have ace five, they can have ace deuce, they can have ace jack. Sure, they can have all of those hands, but they have so much more sevens, deuce x, eights, nines, jack x. This is most of their range. Weaker players like this have way too much offsuit jack getting to the spot. So going for this value jam on the river is important. Okay. This time villain makes the correct fold with the jack, but I tell you what, there'll be many, many people in this pool that do not find that fold. This jack x hand is very abundant in the opponent's range and we have to try and get paid. We start off in this node with something like 75-80% equity, so not trying to win the rest of villain's money with that amount of equity is a criminal offence. The bad thought process here is to assume that what happened in the hand happens all of the time. To say, well, they're only calling with better, and that's the biggest load of shit I've ever heard. It may be true of some people, but it's absolutely absurd to say that that's true of the pool collectively. It's going to be the case that a low-stacked weaker player stations off the rest of their stack with jack x and even worse, pretty frequently. So go for value with that high equity hand. Don't let this river deter you. And that does it for today, guys. If you enjoyed this video and you like these shorter Tuesday replayed session reviews, do let me know in the comments. Check out carrotcorner.com for everything else from us, including our quick course cash injection that's sure to put loads of these juicy, aggressive exploits into your game immediately and give you a quick boost to that win rate. See you next time.